I was now sitting on a 21 hour flight to Jakarta with two brief stopovers in Abu Dhabi and Singapore. I spent the last two weeks preparing for my mystery interview with Suzie. I renewed my instrument rating, studied my notes from flight training and booked my hotel in Jakarta. I also quit my job in order to get time off for the interview and spent what little savings I had on my instrument rating renewal and trip to Indonesia. I was now officially broke. If I didn't get this job with Suzie, I wouldn't have anything left for me when I got back to England. Failing this interview simply wasn't an option for me. However, fortunately, I had an ace up my sleeve. Shortly before my trip to Jakarta, I found another candidate who was also coming for the interview with Suzie at the same time as me. His name was Vladik, a Hungarian pilot who also happened to be a genius. We found each other on an online pilot, pilot's forum and we arranged to meet up in Jakarta shortly before the interview. And this brings me to the first lesson of this book. Lesson one, you can never prepare too much for a job interview. Prior to my interview, I had studied a lot, not just the basics of aviation, such as principles of flight and air law, but more specifically studying the Cessna Grand Caravan. I downloaded the Caravan's AFM or Airplane Flight Manual and carefully studied the specifications, limitations and diagrams of the 536 page document. I had prepared a lot for this interview, or at least so I'd thought. That was until I met up with Vladik in Jakarta. Vladik, unsatisfied with just studying the Caravan's AFM, had also decided to study all of the aircraft's maintenance manuals. These are documents specifically designed for engineers, not pilots. Vladik was a geek, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. He was a couple of years younger than me and was also a flight instructor who had worked in Florida. After meeting him in Jakarta, it was soon apparent that he knew a lot more about the caravan than I did. And for me, that was a serious wake-up call. If the other candidates were up to the same standard as Vladik, I would be going home empty-handed. I knew that I had good knowledge of aviation, but this guy really was a whole new level. However, fortunately for me, Vladik wasn't only incredibly smart and knowledgeable, he was also a really nice guy. He gave me all of his study notes and taught me a few things about the caravan which I didn't previously know. I thought well, this was a particularly kind gesture given that we were potentially competing for the same job. To this very day, I still have the highest regards for him. If anyone deserved to succeed in life through their intellect, work ethic and kindness to others, it was Vladik. The following day, Suzie would fly myself, Vladik and the other interview candidates from Jakarta to Pangandaran, a coastal town in the south of Java. Pangandaran was the home of Suzie's owner, Suzy Pujiastuti, and also the training base for all of the pilots and engineers. It was there that we would have the interview and assessment. We arrived at Halim Airport, a busy regional airport in the south of Jakarta, at 9am to ensure that we had plenty of time to check in prior to our 10.30am scheduled flight. Whilst waiting in the departure lounge, we would meet the other two interview candidates, a Spanish guy called Alejandro and a Canadian guy called Nassim. The first thing that would strike me from this meeting is that myself, Vladik and Alejandro were all smartly dressed, wearing pilot shirts and black trousers. Nassim on the other hand was wearing shorts and t-shirt. This seemed a tad bizarre given that we were flying to Pangadaran for a job interview. Yes, it was hot as hell and yes, perhaps wearing a suit and tie would have been a bit inappropriate for that particular latitude of the world. But shorts and t-shirts, really? However, what Nassim lacked in dress sense, and also common sense, he made up for in good humour. The guy couldn't stop smiling or talking. It was the kind of guy he would just love to drink a beer with. Just the one beer though, as after that he'd probably get a bit annoying. At around 10.15am, our small single engine caravan landed in Halim and taxied to the terminal. 
The fact that the wingspan was just a third that of the other aircraft parked up on the apron didn't take away the fact that our little caravan had a whole parking stand to itself. A parking stand big enough for a Boeing 737. We were summoned to the gates along with eight other fare paying passengers where we proceeded to board the 14 seater aircraft. Myself and the other interviewees naturally rushed ahead of all the other passengers so that we could sit up front and view the cockpit. We weren't disappointed with our seats. The captain and first officer turned around and introduced themselves. They were only too eager to show us what they were doing. After the first officer completed her final walk around of the aircraft, the captain started the engine. Although the caravan has a propeller, that propeller is powered by a jet engine as opposed to a piston engine. It's known as a turboprop aircraft. And to low wired pilots like us, there was nothing sweeter than the sound of a jet engine spooling up. After the captain completed the engine start, he gave the hand signal for the ground crew to disconnect the ground power. About one minute later, we began our taxi to the holding point of the three kilometer long runway. Naturally, being in a small caravan, we didn't need to taxi all the way to the end of the runway. We instead taxied to the closest holding point, approximately halfway down the runway. It didn't take too long for air traffic control, or ATC for short, to clear us for takeoff. After lining up, the first officer, who was the pilot flying, slowly advanced the power lever halfway until the propeller speed stabilized to 1900 RPM, before advancing the power lever further to approximately 1800 foot-pounds of torque. We accelerated quickly down the runway, lifting off in just 15 seconds. Even though we started the takeoff roll halfway down the runway, we still had enough tarmac in front of us to land again after liftoff. The caravan is known as a stall aircraft, which stands for short takeoff and landing. This means it's perfectly engineered to transport heavy payloads to and from short landing strips. The weather was hazy, which was normal for Jakarta due to the smog and humidity. We could see many buildings below us However, we had virtually no forward visibility. Passing 5,000 feet, the visibility began to improve. We can now see Jakarta in a way in which people simply couldn't see from the ground. A city surrounded by mountains and rainforest. We reached our cruising altitude of 11,500 feet, and that's when the fun began. Despite being morning, the cumulus clouds in front of us had already began to grow upwards due to the blistering equatorial heat. The weather radar on board showed large patches of magenta, indicating high levels of water vapour and turbulence inside the clouds. The clouds had already peaked above our cruise altitude and were still growing vertically. We couldn't climb above the weather due to our aircraft being unpressurised, of course, we couldn't fly under the clouds due to the terrain. That, of course, left just one option, to navigate around the weather. Myself and the other interviews watched as the pilots made various turns from left to right in order to avoid the worst of the weather. This avoidion technique is known in the industry as cloud surfing. The aim is to avoid flying into the cloud whilst deviating from track as little as possible in order to save fuel. It's a technique which is actually quite fun to practice and takes a while to master. It also gives the passengers a more interesting ride than simply flying straight and level. Some passengers enjoyed this technique anyway, not so much the nervous flyers. About 45 minutes into the flight, we began our descent into New Saburo Airport, a small tarmac airstrip approximately 10 miles away from Pangandaran. The descent would be high speed, accelerating from around 130 knots in the cruise to 165 knots in the descent. Ahead of us we could see a ridge of smaller mountains separating us from the south coast of Java. We passed approximately 1000 feet over the top and around one mile either side of these mountains during our descent. Our pilots at the time were flying visually, however it was clear to see that there wouldn't have been much margin for error had we deviated off track was flying inside of cloud. Flying in Indonesia, especially in smaller aircraft, is very unforgiving. There have been plenty of good pilots and their passengers 
who have paid the ultimate price for misjudging the height and position of the terrain, especially when flying in poor visibility. After clearing the terrain, we turn to the left onto a long final approach for runway 07 in Nusaru, a medium sized 900 meter landing strip. The touchdown from the first officer was relatively smooth, although the tarmac on the runway was far from it. Both the runway surface and that of the apron was bumpy and distorted from the extreme heat and precipitation which was normal for Indonesia. We were marshalled onto a relatively small parking area. Suzy only shared Nusaru Airport with a small flying school so there was plenty of space for our caravan to park. Shortly after the engine had shut down, the ground crew opened up the rear passenger door and we disembarked. We headed to the terminal, a small single story building where we picked up our luggage. Two Suzy and minibuses were waiting for us outside. It would be a 45 minute drive from hell to get to the headquarters in Pangandaran. The narrow road was covered in potholes the size of craters. However, that wouldn't stop our driver from weaving around these potholes and the oncoming traffic at between 80 to 90 kilometers an hour, which is about 50 to 60 miles per hour. Needless to say, we were all very happy to arrive at our destination. The Susia headquarters covered several hectares of land. On the west side of the compound were the office buildings, on the east side, the pilot's hotel, and on the north side, Susie's personal mansion, surrounded by a large lake resembling something like a moat around a castle. We agreed to that Susie compound by Tofik, an Indonesian working for Susie's HR department. Tofik helped us check into the hotel and gave us our rosters for the rest of the day. We had to each share a bedroom with another interviewee. Separate beds, obviously. In my case, I was sharing with Nassim. Myself and Nassim had a similar roster. After lunch, we would spend the rest of the day taking the online exams, whilst the following day we would have the simulator assessment and final interview. The online exam started with the compass test, a grueling three hour long exam, testing everything from maths, spatial awareness, personality and reaction times. The compass test wasn't necessarily that difficult, however due to the length of time involved, it was wise to use a toilet before you started. After a 15 minute break, we then continued with the two other shorter exams. One technical exam for the caravan and one exam on air law. Both exams were fairly straightforward, multiple choice exams. We weren't given the results for any of these exams straight away. However, I was fairly confident that I passed them all. Later that evening, after dinner, Nassim asked me if I wanted to go out for a beer in town. I was reluctant at first. Nassim was quick to point out that neither one of us had any assessments rostered until after lunch the following day. He also pointed out that we hadn't yet had a chance to explore Pangandaran. He was actually kind of right. We'd been inside the Soucier compound ever since we arrived, and yeah, we definitely needed to explore. I agreed to go out for a beer. Just one beer. There weren't any taxis or buses in Pangandaran. If you wanted to go somewhere, you either walked, took your own transport, or waved down a baychuk. A baychuk is an Indonesian version of a rickshaw, with a driver pedaling a bike which pushes the passenger compartment in front. Baychuks are designed to carry two passengers, however, not in our case. You see, Nassim wasn't just larger than life, he was just large. At 6 foot in height and 220 pounds in weight, about 100 kilograms, I certainly wasn't going to fit in with him. We took two separate bay checks. I felt kind of bad for Nassim's driver. He looked like he was around 80 years old and about to collapse from a heart attack. We went to a bar on the beach front called Bamboo Bar. Bamboo Bar would be the first of many bars by that name in Pangandaran. Unfortunately, the original bamboo bar which we were drinking in would be mysteriously destroyed in an accidental fire later that month, shortly before several competitors would open up their own bamboo bars across the road. That's just how competition works sometimes in Indonesia. Not knowing anything about Indonesian beer, we ordered two bintangs. Bintang, which is Bahasa for star, 
was the most popular beer in Indonesia. It also tasted like fermented pipe cleaner. Disappointed with our first choice, myself and Asim then ordered two Ankers from the bartender. Anker was the second most popular beer in Indonesia. Unlike Bintang, it was actually drinkable, at least in my opinion. That's not to say it was a particularly good beer, but it was the next best thing to nothing. Nassim would spend the following hour trying to teach me the Canadian national anthem. Not wanting to get particularly pissed before our important assessments the following day, I decided to leave Bamboo Bar after about one hour. Nassim reluctantly followed me shortly before downing a final shot of Arak for good luck, which was given to him on the house by the bartender. That would be the last time that I would see the original Bamboo Bar. Myself and Nassim woke up the following morning with a mild hangover. I'd only drunk two bottles of beer the night before, but there was something very toxic in that Indonesian beer. Head spinning, we walked downstairs for breakfast. Waiting for me downstairs was Tofik. He informed me that the roster for the day had changed and that I was now due to be in the simulator in just one hour. Nassim, however, still had his original roster. Nassim had several hours to get rid of his hangover and prepare for his simulator assessment. He casually walked into the dining room and sat down for breakfast without a care in the world. After a couple of slices of plain toast and two extra strong cups of coffee, I proceeded to the simulator room. I was a fly simulator of a PA-28, an aircraft which fortunately I was only too familiar with. The assessment was by sole reference to instruments. In other words, there was nothing to see outside the window. It's nothing particularly tricky, just some holds, radial intercepts and an ILS, an instrument landing system approach. Mike Salmon seemed like a nice enough guy. He introduced himself and asked me some questions about myself and my previous flying experience, shortly before giving me a quick brief regarding the simulator assessment. There weren't going to be any emergencies or failures, he just wanted to see that I had a basic level of instrument flying competency and that I had good spatial and situational awareness. Despite a slight headache from the night before, my assessment went fairly smoothly. The examiner changed the direction of the wind a few times to see if I'd notice and make the necessary heading corrections, but otherwise the assessment was fairly straightforward. Approaching the minimum altitude on the ILS, and of course not being able to see anything outside, I executed a go-around. The examiner then paused the simulator and informed me that I passed before complimenting me on my altitude and track keeping. I thanked him and left the simulator room with a confident smile on my face. That was now one less assessment to worry about. A few hours later, as I was studying for the final interview in our room, Nassim came in looking a tad pissed off. It turned out that he had completely ballsed up his simulator assessment. And when I say that he completely ballsed it up, I mean that despite having all of his navigation and equipment fully functional, he managed to get lost. Not just deviate off track, but actually get completely lost. Don't ask me how, but it happened. Despite this, the examiner, with permission from the training manager of Suzier, informed Nassim that he'd be given one more chance at the simulator assessment. He would have just one more hour to prepare for his second and final simulator assessment. Not wanting to see him upset, I offered to help him prepare for his simulator assessment. Vladek had helped me previously with my interview preparation. Reciprocating his kind actions with another interview candidate was the very least that I could do. I sat down with Nassim at a table in the dining room downstairs with a pen and a few sheets of paper. It was soon apparent that this guy didn't even know how to join a holding pattern, a very basic task for a pilot, let alone stay in that hold without deviating off track. I drew him some diagrams of hold entries. It all seemed completely new to him. Alejandro, the other interviewee, came to our table and also helped explain some of the basics to Nassim. I had my final interview at the same time as Nassim's simulator assessment. Not wanting to distract myself from my own priorities, I left Nassim in the capable hands of Alejandro and walked to the training manager's office where the final interview would be held. After a 10 minute wait outside, I was invited into the office by Mr. Chung, the training manager, and Irvin, 
the HR manager. There are two things that I would later learn from the pilots in Suzie regarding Mr. Chung. Firstly, Chung was actually his first name, not his last. And secondly, nobody else prefixed his name with Mr. It appears that he just wanted the new guys to call him that for some bizarre reason, despite the rest of the company being on a first name basis, with the exception of Suzie herself. Chung was a former Singaporean Air Force pilot, or at least so he would claim. He had a very good theoretical knowledge of aviation, however his practical knowledge, or lack thereof, would cause many pilots in Susia to question his previous flying experience. Irvin was an Indonesian national who had been working with the owners of Susia, Susie Pujiastuti and Christian von Strombeck since the very beginning in 2004. Evan was, for the most part, Susie's right-hand man, or a spy within the ranks, you could say. He wasn't necessarily the best man for the position of HR manager. However, he was trusted a great deal by Susie. Most Susie employees, quite rightly, distanced themselves from Irvin. Irvin would initiate the interview with a few personal questions about my background, which lasted about five minutes whilst Chung looked through the results of my online and simulator assessments. Chung informed me that I performed well on all the assessments. He then initiated the technical part of the interview. He asked me a few random questions on aviation knowledge, including one question where I needed to correctly identify four different types of flap systems which he had drawn on the whiteboard, and explained the advantages and disadvantages of each. He then showed me an approach plate of a nearby airport. An approach plate is an official document with all the necessary diagrams and information regarding a given instrument approach procedure. The only problem was that this particular approach plate didn't appear to be an official document. It was a very amateur homemade approach procedure with a low resolution Suzie logo copied and pasted in the top corner. Chung asked me what was wrong with the approach plate. This appeared to be a trick question. Not wanting to state the obvious regarding this amateur attempt of passing off an official document, I closely inspected each part of the page. I didn't want to just blurt out that some idiot in the training department had designed their own homemade approach without all of the necessary legal and safety processes. Maybe expected to fly these homemade approaches, who knew? I noted that there was no published minimum set altitude or MSA for this approach, and brought it to Chung's attention. He smiled and replied, yes, and? I looked again at the approach plate. Was it a trick question? I brought it to Chung's attention that there was no validity date on the approach plate. He smiled and again replied, yes, and? This appeared to be a test of honesty more than anything else. I just came right out and said it. Um, this isn't a proper safe or legal approach plate. Chung grinned. He appeared to be delighted with my final answer. Chung asked me a few more questions relating to the caravan from basic limitations to the effect of the slipstream from the propeller on the tail fin of the aircraft. Chung then made me an offer which I simply couldn't refuse. Chung told me that he would offer me a job right there and then, but on one condition. He wanted me to join the training department as an instructor just six months after I get my upgrade to captain. This was amazing, I thought. I was expecting to wait at least a couple of weeks after the interview before I'd be offered a job. And this job offer also included an early promotion? Sure, he was probably desperate for new instructors as very few of the other pilots seemed to want to work for the guy. But nonetheless, this was an excellent opportunity. Needless to say, I agreed and shook his hand. I now had my first commercial flying job.